Dr David Drew. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm delighted to take part on the first uh, <coughs> day of the Queen's speech. Uh, the speech was more about a political programme for the forthcoming general election than it was about how this country is going to be governed. And sadly, the Brexit morass, which will envelop us all, will carry on regardless of what happens on Saturday and whatever happens by the end of this month. But I would start on a conciliatory note, uh, and the one which I'm very pleased to add my own comments on, and that's the commendation to our late friend Paul Flynn. Yeah, yeah. Paul helped me enormously. He always said I would become an MP. He proved that point right. And he yeah. always came over to Stroud to help me on numerous occasions, and I yeah. owe him so much. And he clearly is someone we all miss on this side, and I hope the whole House will feel yeah. the same way. Yeah. Now, the actual speech is not significant so much of what was in it, as I said, there's a lot of politicisation in that speech, but sadly what was not in it, no mention again of the WASPy women, a tragedy that we as a whole house have got to face up to sometime. No mention of housing, which is the key issue for many of us in terms of how public service has got to deliver much better. Yes, a mention of animal welfare, but again, a very minuscule part of the real needs of where we need to be going in terms of animal welfare. A genuine animal welfare bill is required, and yet we're now talking about trophy hunting, just as we talked previously about ivory bands. Very important in their own right, but not what we should be doing, which is looking for a much more comprehensive approach to the way in which our constituents and many of our constituents do vote on the issue of animal welfare, feel we should be taking things forward much more quick, uh, quickly and radically. Come now, on. I give way to my honourable friend. I thank my honourable friend for, for giving way. And, and I think the point he's alluding, he's making very, some very powerful points, that, that this speech almost seemed tokenistic in that it was, it was almost like a shopping list of, of ambitions and, and, and touching touch points of things that the, the government, the Prime Minister, felt to be important. But on su something such as housing, so critical, so vital to what is needed out there, when we have homelessness and rough sleeping at record levels, people desperate, dying on the streets, how could that not have been mentioned? Well, of course, and that's what should have been in this Queen's speech, and that's what we should be prioritising, along with, I say, the abolition of universal credit, which has proved to be a monumental mistake. Nothing wrong with the concept, but the delivery of universal credit has caused such hardship in all our constituencies, and I'm afraid it is beyond reform. We have to get rid of it, and we have to start with something different. The Prime Minister, in the defence of the King, uh, uh, Queen's speech talked a lot about One Nation, and I know the Conservatives like to talk about themselves as the One Nation Party. Sadly, the way things could turn out, we could be facing One Nation, because the other three parts of the United Kingdom, for various reasons, no longer seem to be, want to be part of this One Nation. And I really worry about the level of English nationalism which is now driving the Conservative Party. I think we have a fundamental problem, and I agree with the Honourable Lady for Brock's dough in the sense that we need radical constitutional reform. And that includes devolution in this country of England, where we have failed to really do anything to do with the centralisation of power. And that, again, is a fundamental reason why I think people voted for Brexit, because they feel disconnected from the way in which decisions are made. And that comes into the need for a really fundamental rethink. Votes at 16, electoral reform. Yes, and unitary authorities, which the Honourable Lady alluded to. And I'm always pleased to say, as someone who spent 28 years on a parish and town council, that means taking power to a level which is not the lowest level, it's the first level of government. And that is important because people can then see what's happening in their communities. Now, Brexit really has caused huge divisions. But it's also led to this government effectively wasting the last year. I do really regret and resent the fact that we are having back the agricultural bill, the fisheries bill. 
We didn't even get as far as the Environment Bill, but all these are fundamental pieces of legislation that should have been enacted over the last year. We may disagree over what was going into those bills. We had a critique at committee stage, but sadly the Agriculture Bill, for those who were on it, and I led on behalf of the opposition, it disappeared last November, never to be seen again. There is nothing that that does other than cause disillusion. Farmers are just saying, notwithstanding the uncertainty over Brexit, what policy is going to be in place if we crash out, but more particularly even if we don't crash out, that we will need an agricultural policy which is understood and which has taken account of this idea of public monies for public goods, see that in practice, see how it's going to work. But at the moment, we've just got a huge void. Likewise, in terms of mental health, I welcome the fact this is in the bill. And, sorry, it's in the Queen's speech and will subsequently come forward, hopefully, with a bill in its own right. The problem with this is, and I go around my schools like, like many other members do, I've done 40 schools in the last year. Besides funding and st staff stability, the third issue all schools raise with me is their children's mental health. It's at a stage now where it is a crisis. You can't underestimate how bad things are. And of course, it's not just the children, it's, it's their families. We have a significant problem even in Gloucestershire with off-rolling. That's a lot to do with parents who don't believe their children can get special needs provision within the normal system, but also it's about the way parents can take their children out of school, so-called home education, nothing wrong with home education in theory, but they aren't then educating their children. So those children are being taken out more as a companion rather than a parent-child relationship, and that's something that should be addressed by proper investigation and in due course of time proper legislative context being put in place. My honourable friend for Swansea West, sadly not with us at the moment, did talk about air quality being a key issue and I hope that will be addressed either through the Environment Bill or in its own right. I would just add for the points that he had to say the significant issue of incineration which does lead to smaller particulates, which has enormous impact upon the health of children in particular. We've never investigated it. It should be something which is paramount in terms of the way in which we try to drive up air quality. Yes, of course traffic is seen as the major uh, cause of that uh, uh, huge issue about our deteriorating health standards but there are other parts to it and disposal of our waste through appropriate means either by not creating that waste, waste or by getting rid of it so it's in a non-polluting manner is crucial to that and that of course brings me on to the biggest the biggest loss in the Queen's speech which is the failure to address climate change in a proper way 2050 is far far too late I had the opportunity earlier this evening to go along to the Parliamentary and Scientific Committee where three experts, including the former Chief Scientist, Sir David King, basically argued that we're not anywhere near meeting the obligations in this country, let alone in, in the wider world. Two degrees will cause climate change catastrophe. We need to understand that. That's why I'm proud to stand by my constituents. As many of you know, Extinction Rebellion came from Stroud. Many of my constituents are out there at every moment in time. And uh, I'm happy to help them wherever I can. But I would just pay due regard to Polly Higgins, who was the, the creator of Ecoside. Again, laterally, she became a Stroud constituent. We need to look at Ecoside, to look at the implications, and there is an opportunity this week for it to come to a briefing, of how we can pass a law which means that we're not leaving a worse situation to our children, and particularly our grandchildren, something that we should feel desperately keen to avoid doing at every cost. So let's listen to the scientists, let's listen to the campaigners and let's do something in this place rather than talk about it. In conclusion, please that the domestic abuse bill has been carried over and we'll see hopefully the light of day. Let's make sure that that is a, a piece of legislation that isn't watered down, that includes 
actions like banning sham man mar uh, marriages, make sure it's not just linked into immigration and human rights, but it stands in its own right. So we will debate the bills as they come forward on this side. We will seek to radically improve the legislation. We will make sure that there is an alternative. We heard earlier that it was all about the, the previous government's failings in power. I would argue austerity was a political programme. We're now coming to the end of that. Now, I would say that it was an unnecessary and really punitive way in which any government has tried to really deal with the poorest and most vulnerable in our society. But if we have come out of austerity, now is the time to see the real changes, the changes that are desperately needed so that we have a more humane society and a society that does address the issues like housing, education, health, as well as trying to deal with the morass of Brexit, but most particularly we deal with climate change.